Hello, welcome to this video on um, Thomas Eginus, Introduction to Sanskrit, uh, Lesson 8. Um, in this video we'll be doing the grammar and the uh, vocabulary at pages 87 to 93, and after that we'll go on to do the exercises in a separate video. Let me call up the iPad for you. Here we are. So the main topic of the grammar in this lesson is um, Sandhi. And we've already done a fair bit of Sandhi. And this sets out a number of the rules in greater detail, and in particular the, the rules for vowels. And there's a separate set of rules for consonants, um, which we'll deal with as we as we go along. So going through now the the text of the of the book, um, and looking at the top of page eighty seven, the word sandhi means combination or junction point. Um, actually, the word sandhi um, is cognate, directly cognate with the Greek synthē. Sorry, I've probably written that very well. Synthē. Um, synthē, together, as in synthē, put, putting together, from which, of course, we get, um, it's come into English as synthesis. The synthesis, putting together. And that's exactly what san synthē is. The rules of Sandhi, Thomas Eginus goes on, ensure that sounds will combine in a pleasing euphonic way. Panini refers to these junction points as samhita or togetherness. Samhita is actually also putting together um, the root uh, dha, which is to put when it comes at the when that word comes as um, a word final in a noun, it flips to di. So sandha to put together, sandhi is the noun meaning put together, and it's an irregular verb in the sense that the past participle of dha is hita. So when you see this word sanghita, it just means put together. It's the past participle as opposed to the noun sandhi putting together. There are two types of sandhi rules there's the external sandhi where you get one word and then a, a new word and what happens between the the word that's finished and the new word that joins onto it. That's the external sandhi because the sandhi is external to the word and the internal sandhi that is um, changes within a word. The sandhi rules involve sound changes so that the flow of language is smoothed. As mentioned in Lesson 2, an apple is smoother to pronounce than a apple. The house is pronounced differently than the other house. The or the, depending on what follows. The rules in English are simple enough. They're a little bit more complex in, the, in Sanskrit. But it's all the same principle. It's just euphonic flow. And one point to notice is that whereas in most languages the, the sandhi that naturally occurs isn't reflected in the script. In Sanskrit it is reflected in the script and that dates back to historical times um, when such great importance was attached to the, the correct enunciation, particularly of the Vedic mantras and so, so on. Um, so that is why you will see these Sandhi rules reflected in the, in the script. Incidentally there are um, to in this in our times, newspapers and periodicals published in simple Sanskrit in India, you can easily find them on the in, internet. And because um, the rules of Sandhya are generally regarded as a little bit complex, these publications are done without Sandhi. Um, so you can see each word just individually as it would appear in isolation. And that is to assist students. 
So, um, yes, back to against these, which means the house and the other house are examples of external santi. The santi rules of Sanskrit exist because the Sanskrit tradition has been primarily an oral tradition, that's right, as I just mentioned, and because its grammatical insights were so sophisticated. And the term santi, it says, has been adopted by modern linguists to describe sound modifications between words in any language. Um, yes, that's right. For example, in um, in um, textbooks about um, spoken Chinese, for example, whether it be Mandarin or Cantonese or any of the others, um, you'll hear about tone sandhi, where you know, a, a word that's pronounced in one tone on, in isolation might change tone when it's followed by a word in, in another particular tone. Um, that's, that's the same principle at work, that is tone sandhi in Chinese. And Thomas Ignis goes on to say, helpfully, don't allow the Santi rules to overwhelm you. Um, yeah, there are, there's a fair amount of rules to learn. However, no one rule in itself is particularly difficult. Each one of it, each one on its own, is a rather simple piece of information, easy to assimilate. Not only that, um, but you will see repeating patterns. Um, this is a point I'm going to um, raise in particular when we look at this um, table of vowel sandhi on, on page 89. It looks like an awful amount of stuff to learn, but if you just you know, take a moment to look at the patterns, then hopefully with most of it, you'll say, you'll say ah, yes, yeah, it's got a simple pattern running through. Um, so Egonus goes on, we will begin our study. Um, sorry, I've lost it here. We will begin our study of the external Santi rules using charts. And after we've used the rules for some time, we will memorize them. There will be three charts because external Santi can be divided into three groups. It's the vowel Santi, that's the swara Santi, and then in the next lesson, lesson nine, we look at the final H of the visarga Santi. You've already learned some of that. Um, for example, when um, a word that would on its own end in an ah, nara, vadati, the man speaks, this final ah mutates to o. Oh. So, as, as before, when I put an asterisk in front of a word, um, I mean it's kind of deliberately written incorrectly by way of il illustration. So now this becomes naro vadati. And um, I am Rama. So Rama on its own in the nominative, but I am Rama. Ram, Rama plus I am Asmi becomes Ramusmi. That's the Visarga Sandhi, and there are other other rules as well. And consonant Sandhi, um, that should be dealt with in, in lesson 10. Always when you're looking at Sandhi, um, bear in mind that these weren't fiendish rules invented by somebody. These actually reflect the, the natural movements of speech. Um, so many things we pronounce because it's easier to pronounce them within the phonetic structure of a particular language. And it's exactly the same with, with um, Sanskrit. So, page 88, now I'm reading from the chart on page 89 describes what happens if a word ends in a vowel and the next word begins with a vowel. For example, if one word ends in a short e and the next word begins with an a, then the two combine, they make santi to form ya. So, um, looking at page 88 now, a few um, lines down. Gachati ashvam. Gachati, he, she, it goes, ashvam, accusative of motive, motion, to the horse. That becomes gachatiashvam. The e-a becomes a ya. So the e 
as it were, flips into a, in, into a consonantal y. Gachati ashvam becomes gachati ashvam. And you'll see there how this is um, reflected in the Devanagari script. And word ending in an a, ah, next word begins in an a, ah, short or long, supplies to both short or long equally. Then they merge to make a long a. Ah. Eva ava shishyate becomes eva ava shishyate. Brahma asmi, Brahma asmi. Bhava Arjuna, be O Arjuna. It becomes Bhava Arjuna. On the following page, looking at um, paragraph 5 now, on the following page is the chart describing the Sandhi change if the first word ends in a vowel and the second word begins in a vowel. So, and you'll see the notation here that in this chart, and we can write um, short a ah or long a. Ah. If we want to emphasize that an a ah is short, we write it with an a ah like that. But we normally don't bother, for instance, um, nara, with, written without a mark, that they're automatically short, unless you particularly want to emphasize a difference. So, for example, um, bala and bala, um, we might emphasize the fact by saying the bala, in the word meaning strength, is written with a short a. Ah. But mostly we don't write it because it's unnecessary. Um, in this table, where a vowel is written like this, this means either short a ah, or long a. Ah. That's why you have both signs written above in running text. In running text, in grammars and works explaining the language, you occasionally find it done to indicate that a word, for example, can be pronounced either with um, with a, a long or a short a. Ah. There are some words that are different words, but occasionally they over overlap. For instance, um, bhava as a noun meaning being. Um, sometimes it's a bhava, sometimes bhava. But um, anyway, this is what it means in this um, grammar, as, as in most. So when you see an e written like that, it's an e. If you see it written like that, you know that he's talking about an e that's either a short e or a long e. Um, and it says the chart need not be memorized. Okay, well, I, I would second that. Don't uh, trouble yourselves with that. Just assimilate it gradually as you as you go along. Um, and then, of course, you can refer back to it to the for the exercises. Now, I'm not going to go through this chart in detail. I'm looking at page 89. Um, but what I do want to do is to point out um, some some patterns in it. For example, if you look at the row of vowels, the top horizontal row, one begins a, a, e, e, u, u, and so on. If you look, for example, down the column um, starting E. Where my finger is here. Sorry. You'll see here, by the, and of course the, the horizontal column at the far right of the page, um, the, sorry, the horizontal column at the top of the chart is a vowel at the end of word one, and the vertical column at the right of the page is the, the commencing vowel of word number two. And you just um, see where they join on this chart to what happens to that vowel. So it, there's a fair bit to remember, but this, um, this chart will make, makes it fairly simple. Now, spot some patterns. Ease your 
uh, ease the burden on your memory. If you look at the final vowel E and look down that column, so the E followed by a new word beginning in A becomes Ya. Next one followed by a word beginning in a long A becomes Ya. If one word ends in E or E and the next word begins in E or E, then the vowel coalesces into a long E. The same with A or A followed by A or A just coalesces into a long R. And all of the rest of them, look down the column, The it begins with a Y followed by the vowel in question unchanged. Well, that's very simple now. So if a word ends in an E and the next word begins in a vowel, if the if that vowel is, an, is itself an E, they're identical vowels, short or long, then they just merge into a long E. But if it's any other vowel, all that happens is the E becomes a Y and the other vowel remains unchanged. You will notice that the exactly the same applies to the U. Word ending in U or U, next word beginning in U or U, they merge into a long U, and you can see that in the chart if you go down from U along to the two columns which deal with the word initial, sorry, initial vowel of the second word, U or U, there it is an U, all of the rest, the U changes to a V. So the word ending in U, next word begins in A, begins, becomes a V, 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 and so, so on. Um, you will see that the um, the same um, applies to the ri, the subdotted ri. It flips when it's followed by any vowel apart from itself. It it becomes the consonantal r. So ri a becomes just ra. Look down the column. You'll see that it, that this it where the a final ri combines with an initial ri. Then it just merges into a long r. That's the subdotted r with um with uh, a line over the top. So and in every other case, um, it just flips to a r. So you spot these patterns, and everything will become much simpler. And in case you're wondering, say, hey, um, Sanskrit has not only the short r, but also a long r, why aren't the long r shown? Why isn't the long r shown in the um, top horizontal line of final vowels or the vertical line of initial vowels of the following word? Uh, the answer to that is simply that no Sanskrit word ever ends in a long r, and no Sanskrit word ever begins in a long r. In fact, the long r is, um, you will find it, for example, in um, in roots, r, meaning to, to cross. You'll also find it in um, genitive plurals, of the of roots in tar words in stem tar so for example stem pitar father nominative pita genitive plural piternam of the fathers maternam of the mothers um, I said no word ever ends in a long r. Will you say, well, what about this word I've just written? The answer to that, this is a root. A root is an abstraction. It's not an actual word of the language that you would find in, in running text.
So now we will pass on to the Before we, before we pass on, um, just look at the final column. That's where the um, final vowel is an ow. And you'll see there, in um, every case, the final ow, followed by a word beginning with a vowel, the ow. just becomes av. So av followed by the by the next vowel. So as I say, once you spot these patterns, the the burden on the memory will become very considerably easier. I'm turning now to page ninety. Um, certain examples given: says e plus u becomes u, r plus e becomes r, i plus u becomes u. So getcheti iti becomes gachetiti. And then he refers to additional examples later in the book. And remember that the the apostrophe sign that's the apostrophe sign um, which we use in the English uh, we can call it complex apostrophe there. Um, Devanagari equivalent is that. So Ramusmi as um, in English, in sorry, in the Latin script, we write Ramosmi. In sorry, my pen's gone funny. Electronic pen. Sorry, my pen is, oops, my electronic pen is getting a little bit odd. So, Ramosmi, and this sign here, the Avagraha, um, represents the, the, the missing A. Ah. So, the A ah of Asmi is dropped out. It's and replaced by the Avagraha. Uh, the Avagraha isn't always put in, but I think in texts printed nowadays, you will, I think, almost invariably see it put in. If you do ever go delve into reading older texts in the Devanagari, you might not find it. But um, by the time you reach that stage, you will be, you will probably be far beyond needing any help from from me. Um, so the example is given in Grame in the village Atra here becomes Grametra. Now, in a very important rule, um, once the Sunday rules have been applied, there is no further application of Sunday. Sunday rules are only applied once. That is a very important rule, and I'm just going to explain it um, a little bit further. So, the horses are coming. I'll write it without Sunday first. The horses Ashva, singular, Ashva, masculine, plural, nominative. The horses are coming. Agachanti. Now, where you have um, a long A with Visarga, as here, Ashva, followed by the next word beginning with a vowel, the Visarga drops out. So you get Ashva Agachanti. Now you might say the Visarga has dropped out, so we have this word ending in a long A, Ashva, 
the next word beginning with long R, agachanti, shouldn't we merge those? Ashvagachanti, answer is no. Because we have applied san, the sandhi rule here, where I'm underlined to ashvag agachanti, drop out the visarga. Once you have applied that sandhi rule, you'll often find that there is a vowel hiatus there, ashva agachanti, leave that as it is. This is the meaning of the rule stated in um, paragraph 9 on page 90. Once they've been applied, there is no further application. So leave that as it is. So ashva agachanti is correct. Uh, Number 10, in this text, words are always separated in transliteration, that's in the Roman script, unless two vowels have formed one long vowel, such as e plus e. Um, in Devanagari script, words involving vowels and the adjoined, except where there's, there is a space, a hiatus between the vowels and the chart. Um, so, for example, um, if you look in the second last, oh yeah, look, look at the bottom row, back to page 89. Look at that bottom row um, where you have the um, final vowel, ow, I'm looking here at the first item in the bottom row, the final vowel, ow, um, and the Initial, sorry, final vowel. Sorry, I got myself in a twist there. I meant to say, look at um, across the across the first row. That's the initial vowels. Get to where it says a, e, as in a e u r a. E. Now look down to the bottom. You see what happens where a final vowel a e meets an initial vowel ow. Now you'll see that it's written as two separate things. The final a e becomes an a, uh, and the following ow remains unchanged. So a uh, ow. That's what Thomas Eginus means when he says where you see a space between the vowels and the chart. You see the a uh, ow space. That indicates that in Sanskrit, where the word, one word ends in an a e and the next word begins with an ow, the final a e becomes a, so you get a, ow, and it stay, stays like that, so you get what's in a, a vowel hiatus. You may hear the expression primary hiatus and secondary hiatus used. All that that means is that where you get a word before sandhi has been applied, um, ending in an as, for example, the next word begins in an e, then they merge together, become a. E. That's the primary hiatus, the two vowels in their original form merge. The secondary hiatus is after the application of sandhi, is there still a gap between the vowels, as in this um, a, ow becomes a, ow, as I mentioned. That's known as a, a secondary hiatus. And that is the one that remains as a hiatus in accordance with this um, rule in paragraph 9, namely once you've applied the sandhi, you only apply it once. Um, looking now at the top of page 91, gacchati iti is pronounced and written gacchati iti, gacchati ashvam becomes gacchati ashvam, so the ti a becomes Tia, written as a T-Y-A. One point I would mention is that you will find some texts, and I do it in some of my um, textual analyses, and for example, some dictionaries do it. The Monio Williams Sanskrit Dictionary does it as well. Where you get, for example, A plus A, ending in A, beginning with A, they, they merge to A. And they're written in the Devanagari script just as a long R. Uh. In some Romanized texts, you will instead of, you will put the a circumflex 
to indicate that this vowel is the result of a merger of two vowels. So, so, so um, a plus, sorry, a plus e will merge into a and will be so written in Devanagari, but sometimes in a text you'll see a circumflex written. That circumflex is simply a device to assist the learner to spot that it is two vowels merged. For example, um, one could, I normally don't write, but you could write the bodhicharya avatara, bodhicharya avatara, bodhicharya, or bodhicharya avatara, merges the bodhicharya avatara. That word for in the Moni Williams dictionary would be written with, um, with uh, a circumflex over the a ah to indicate that it's the merger of the, those two vowels. Now, rule, paragraph 11 rather, page 91, that I mentioned when we were looking at the chart earlier. In vowel Sunday, often a vowel will be replaced by the semi-vowel that corresponds to it. For example, e to y and u to b. According to Panini, the change from the corresponding semi-vowel to the vowel is called the samprasarana, but we'll, uh, we'll come to that a little bit later. Um, and then in the middle of the page, um, just some examples are given that the e becomes a y, the, the r becomes a consonantal r, the dental r, the retro l becomes an ordinary l. It's extremely rare that you find that. Um, the label u, u becomes a v, very common that you find that. So some vowels um, which often or which under the normal rules would be subject to sandhi are not subject to sandhi in certain um, certain circumstances in the dual number um, Many duals end in an e, or an u, or an e. For example, um, if we take vanam, forest, neuter, neuter noun, vana, vanam. The dual of it, two forests, is um, vane, which coincidentally looks the same. This is the dual masculine, sorry, the, it's a neuter word, is the dual nominative and accusative. Vane is also the singular locative in the forest. So he is in the forest. Vane. by Santi that is going to become um, Vanesti he is in, in the forests where well, however it means two forests they come to the two forests. Vene agachanti. If you look at the table on page 89, you will see that normally if a word ends in an A, look across the top column, the top row, sorry, um, the A entry, look down to where, just two rows down, um, you see that a plus a play plus a rather just becomes the a and then the hiatus a 
where the A represents the dual number, it remains unchanged. So it's not Vana Agachanti, but Vane Agachanti remains unchanged. And the same happens where you get the E and the U endings of the of the dual. Not that common, but just um, it's worth remembering this rule. The E and the U would normally change to a V, a Y or a V with a following vowel. But if they're dual endings, they, they don't. So we now go over to page 92. Um, grammar, a declension of neuter nouns. And we look at the word pala, meaning a fruit. Cognate, actually, with the you know, Latin fructu the pa, fra, and our word fruit. Um, words of the same origin. Note that the these neuter nouns in a short a. Ah. The declension is identical with the noun, the masculine nouns in a short a, ah, with the exception um, of the nominative and the accusative. Um, and of course the evocative. So, so the so the the vocative. Um, o fruit, the pala, and o man nara, o king bupala. So in the singular, it's the same. In the dual and the plural, the locative is the same as the nominative. But that rule applies throughout the language. The vocatives are different from nominatives only in the singular. In the dual and the plural, they are always the same as the, as the nominative, right across all words in the in, in the language. So ignoring the vocative for the moment, um, just look at the nominative and the accusative in this table. Um, pal, the nominative is palam and the accusative palam. Look at the singular. This reflects the position with, I think, all um, inflected into European languages that the nominative and the accusative are the same form. Um, the nominative, if it's a masculine noun, it changes nara, naram, and so on. A river, a feminine noun, it changes nadi, a river, nadim, the accusative. Um, Nominative and accusative are always the same in neuters. It's the same in Latin and Greek, the Slavonic languages, German as well. Look at the dual now. Um, pale. The confusingly, you will get to know it. It doesn't occur that commonly. Um, that. This form, the dual nominative and accusative for the neuter is um, is the same as the locative singular. Um, but remember again, this is where the rule that if a the if a dual ends in an a, that a is not subject to sandhi. So, for example, um, pale. Um, atti, atti means he is eating. Pale atti, he's eating two fruits. Mm. Um, to make it simple. Pale adanti, they are eating. They are eating two fruits. Although you've got the word ending in an a and the next word beginning with an a, that a remains unchanged because it is a dual ending. Look now at the plural ending. Uh, palani, same as always, of course, because it's a neuter for the nominative and the accusative, and that is the that is the typical um, neuter ending. Lots of words you'll see ending in an ani. You immediately know that that's um, a neuter plural. Look at the others: instrumental, dative, ablative, genitive, locative. No distinction 
at all between the masculine and the and the neuter here. So there's nothing new to be learned. Just the nominative and the accusative. We will look now at the vocabulary before going on to the um, before going on to the exercises. So Amritam immortality. The, the translation is given as immortality or an immortal. Well, um, immortality, as in the neuter, emritam, the undead. Um, yes, it's correct. That is a neuter noun, but as emrita, as a masculine or a masculine feminine neuter, it's an adjective and will. Um, behave like any other adjective ending in a short a, ah. and as a noun, um, a, a, a male masculine immortal is an amrita, and a, a female immortal is an am, amrita. So it's not quite right to say that an amritam is an immortal. Katam, how? As, as uh, a question. Nyanam. By the way, I should mention that. Uh, normally, when we're talking about a word, not in a running text, but talking about the word in isolation, we tend to use the stem form, as we do, talk about the, the Buddha. I'm just talking about that word in its stem form, ending in a short A. Ah, and only then, when we specifically want to give it its case ending, we add the case endings. We do that also with neuter nouns. But Egonus here has put all of these nouns in the list, ending in an M. Um, that's fine. Just bear in mind that these are here specifically put in the nominative slash accusative um, form, ending in a, an M, uh, just to assist the learner to, to remember that they're, they're, they're new to nouns. If we were talking about the, the, the words, um, for example, knowledge, just talking about the word, word knowledge, I would just say jnana, and I'd only, normally we'd only say jnanam if you were discussing the nominative accusative grammatically or if it were in, in a running text, where of course you have to give it its proper case ending. Um, and of course, don't fall into this trap. The word katam, which ends in an um, but it's nothing to do with it being a neuter noun. It's not a neuter noun. It's an indeclinable. It's just fixed in that form, and it means how. Nyanam. Um, most, on the root nya to know, most verbal nouns ending in na or ana are neuter if it's a short a. There, it often has a long a, as for example, vipashyana, deshana, vedana, bhavana, very often found in the feminine. But if the, the final vowel is short a, then they're most commonly neuter rather than masculine. As you'll see, um, well, with this, this word nyanam, a neuter noun, knowledge, follows that general rule. We have the word, uh, now a verb, pat, patati, he reads. Um, let's look at this for a moment. Pat, patati. It makes the modern Hindi actually, par, the, the root, parna, uh, infinitive parna root, par, uh, to read. But for our purposes, the word meaning make a verbal noun out of it, a recitation, you can lengthen the arm, make now a verbal noun, is parta. That became, the language of the recitation was thus the, the party language, and it's party, the recitational language, party, and it's that that transmuted itself into Pali, sometimes written with a dot under the end, Pali. So Pali actually means just the, 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 the recitational, the language of the recitations of the Buddha's teaching uh, from this uh, from this root pat to read. Uh, I'll go down the others. Pustakam, 
a book, palam, which we've just had, fruit, vanam, forest, shastram, scripture. Uh, remember that the very often we have the root followed by the suffix tra, the mantra, yantra, shastra, kanitra, a spade, from kan to, to, to dig. Um, these are mostly, mostly um, Newton nouns, ending in a tra. Tra is an implement or a tool for doing something. So shas to teach, the shastram, um, literally kind of educational tool, the shastras, with a sp particularly in, um, among the the Vedic teachers, they were the texts that we used to, not the actual Vedas themselves, but the subtexts, uh, commentaries and so on, that were used uh, for, for teaching purposes. So that's the, in English, come to English as a, a Shastra, would be Shastrani. Satyam, the truth, from the root Sat, meaning well, the root as, and then it makes the present possible sat. So satyam, truth, and suktam, a hymn. Um, I'll just look at this suktam for a moment. There's the prefix su, that's the idea of well, good or well. There is the root vach to speak or to say and by this samprasarana that we discussed a few moments ago um, the, it makes its past participle because vachta becomes vakta however in Vedic and this is a little bit relevant for us still because of the stress that's now we don't bother with so much. It's not important in classical Sanskrit. It has no effect. It was it in Vedic the final a was a short a but stress so vakta stressed or pronounced in a higher tone not vakta but vakta. And what happened to the initial v now being unstressed just softened itself into an u. So it became ukta. by some percent, the flipping of the va to the u. The same, for example, from the root swap to sleep. Swap ta. Don't be put off by my writing this acute accent over the a. That's just a reference back to the old Vedic grammar to indicate it was higher swap ta. These higher and lower tones uh, are no longer relevant in classical Sanskrit. For example, even in, in classical Greek, in the most ancient form of Greek, they were relevant. You had the higher and lower tones, but when you came through to classical Greek and modern Greek, it's pure stress, nothing to do with tone. And this swapta becomes supta. Swap becomes flips to u. It means asleep. So the su ukta by santi u. And u becomes u, that's where you get the sukta, which um, Egonus translates as a hymn, but um, in literally just means something as well spoken, well said. From an entirely separate root, we get su, meaning to sew or a thread, plus tra, we get sukta and sutra. Which are two different, and let's now look at, we were just talking about supta. So we have these three sukta, sutra, you know what sutra is, and supta. All three of these words, I'm departing slightly from script here to do with Pali, all three of these words become sutta in Pali through natural. Um, phonetic mutation. There has been some discussion whether the Pali Sutta, the Suttas, the Sutras, is in fact from equivalent to the Sanskrit Sutra or the Sanskrit Sukta. There's a good argument for saying either. 
I, mean, I, I tend to the view that um, it's from the sutra, because that's how it's expressed in, in Sanskrit. Um, but no, I, I could be wrong, wrong about that. But this, again, it's an aside. I mention this particularly for the benefit of, the, of those of you who are also Pali students, that this shows the benefit of looking at Pali against the background of Sanskrit, because if you hear that sutta can mean well-spoken or a sutra or asleep, then you might be rather puzzled why the same Pali word sutta can mean all three. Well, if you look at what they, what they originally were in the earlier form of the language, sukta, sutra, supta, all becomes clear. Um, Oh, and then at the bottom of page 93, Aganus makes points that I've already made. And important ones at the at the bottom, neuters decline like masculines, except nominative, accusative, evocative. So that brings us to the end of um, the first part of Lesson 8, uh, Grammar and Vocabulary. And I'll proceed in a, in a separate video um, with the with the exercises.